Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today we are having Dr. J Dr. Joshua Rust uh, presenting on institutions. As, excuse me one second. I just had lost it. Uh, institutions as agents. Uh, he is an associate professor of philosophy at Sesame University. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Rust, and uh, you may take it away. Great. Thanks, Chris. All right. Let me just share my screen. Uh, so I'm going I'm to walk you guys through a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Okay. Can everyone see that? That okay? All right. Um, so, as as many of you know, um, I was on sabbatical last year, um, and uh, the, I have to do this faculty spot, or I was asked to do the faculty spotlight, and uh, and it gave me a chance to kind of step back and try to summarize, maybe over the course of the next forty five minutes, uh, what it was that I, I was trying uh, to do. So. Um, let me let me just by, begin by saying, um, despite the fact that I've been thinking about this stuff for for at least a year, um, I still actually feel really hazy uh, and sort of foggy about it. Right, so um, I'm going to be right. This it, it like I, <laughs> this isn't going to be a clean clean presentation of what I figured out, um, but rather just a, a kind of update about where I am with these issues um, at this point. Um, so institutions as agents. Um, a couple of years ago, I was walking through, I, I was, I found myself in the library. It's actually one of the, you know, one of the, the, the difficult things about having so many uh, resources, electronic resources, scholarship resources available online, is you don't find yourself in the library that often. Um, and of course, well, like one of the advantages to being in the library is since books are grouped by subject, sometimes you can find books um, in a subject area that you're interested in. Um, that you didn't know to look for. And this was one such book. So a guy named uh, William Richard Scott, he's a sociologist uh, at Stanford University, and he wrote a book uh, originally published in 18, or 1982 called Organizations, Rational, Natural, and, and Open system, uh, Systems. And I immediately saw this thing. I'm like, wait, this is exactly what I'm interested in, right? He wants to categorize different ways in which an institution can be um, and has this tripartite categorization. I'll say right now, I'm going to ignore um, the categorization of, of open systems. I'm primarily interested in rational and natural. Uh, indeed, I think his category of, of open systems um, is actually a subclass of, of natural systems. So uh, just beginning with, with Scott, how does he distinguish between uh, rational organizations and natural organizations, um, and uh, and and here's the definitions he offers, which um, are helpful. Now, ultimately, I'm going to I'm going to take issue with him, particularly uh, in his uh, definition of a natural organization. But I think this is a really helpful and intuitive way uh, to sort of begin to think about what uh, an institution that's also an agent might look like. Uh, so non-agentive institutions are rational organizations or rational institutions, and he defines them as collectivities oriented towards the pursuit of relatively specific goals. Um, so that's the first part, right? So they're, they're organized around a specific goal. For example, Stetson University has the goal of, I don't know, educating people. Uh, and uh, rational institutions also exhibit relatively highly formalized social structures, right? So highly codified rules specified in terms of rights um, and obligations often um, outlined in, in terms of bylaws or constitutions, this kind of thing. And in contrast with rational organizations or rational institutions, he describes natural organizations as collectivities uh, whose participants are, are pursuing multiple interests, right? So it's not necessarily founded around a single sort of institutional goal. Um, but the institution and the people in the institution recognize the value of perpetuating the organization as an important resource, right? So notice this focus not less on uh, like a specific goal like education and uh, here in the case of natural institutions, more of a focus on the perpetuation of the institution or survival goal. Uh, moreover, if rational organizations are highly formalized, natural organizations are typified by an informal structure of relations. Uh, and um, yeah, so what are these natural uh, organizations? Um, I think one of the things that's really, that really caught my eye about, uh, what's his name, uh, Scott's distinction is how it challenges some of the sort of orthodox assumptions in my own subfield in philosophy. So I identify as a social ontologist. Uh, social ontologists essentially 
right? Do sociologists do sociology through a philosophical lens? And most of the social ontologists I read assume right, that organizations are rational systems in Scott's sense of the word. Uh, and um, are skeptical of, of even the possibility that some of these social institutions could be compared to natural systems, okay? So what is it to assume that an organization is a rational system? Um, it's to assume that institutions exist for us to, at, uh, along the lines of a social tool, an extrinsically pur purposive social tool, right? Institutions exist to do something for us. Right? That, that's their reason. And if they don't do these things, if they don't have a function, a tool-like function, um, then it's hard to understand why they, they exist or why would we, we would create them. Right? This is the guiding assumption of most social ontologists. So here's a couple of examples. John Searle's social ontologist. And he says, quote, a common element that runs through all or nearly all institutions is that they are enabling structures that increase human power in many different ways. Right. So an enabling structure that increases human power, I read as a tool, right? Just as a hammer increases uh, uh, human power, uh, the monetary system increases human power uh, by allowing us to not have to engage, say, in bar bartering. Another social ontologist is Francisco Guala, uh, and he also embraces the institution as tool metaphor. Uh, uh, but it's more specific. He has a more specific rendition. He says that uh, institutions are instruments that give us the power to resolve cooperation and coordination problems, right? So he's thinking about institution and institutions in terms of uh, social choice. Uh, Jill Vickers says that institutions are instruments of social organization that exercise collective power over a number of generations. And then finally, uh, a final social ontologist is Kirk Ludwig. Uh, now, he's not talking about institutions in general, but corporations, a particular way of being an institution in particular, and he describes a corporation as, quote, a useful way of pooling resources for business purposes. Um, in particular, what corporations do is they limit the risk of shareholders uh, and so spur investment. But what I like about Scott's suggestion is he opens at least the possibility, right, opens our attention to the possibility that some institutions are more helpfully compared to natural systems uh, than tools, to organisms than, tr than tools. Um, that maybe there's a different metaphor in which we can understand at least, uh, the, 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 we can understand the structure of at least a, a subset of institutions. Um, so when Scott makes the suggestion that there are rational tool-like systems and institutions, and that they might be compared to um, natural or organismic type institutions. He's primarily thinking of a sociologist uh, by, that goes by or by by the name of Philip Selznick, um, and uh, he's at, at Berkeley. Um, and interestingly, the founding director of, uh, of the Berkeley's Law and Society program. Okay, so for Selznick. Quote, the most important thing about organizations is that though they are tools, each nevertheless has a life of its own. All right, Susan, your hand went up. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm not thinking in terms of the wrong metaphor. Would uh, yeah. natural, the second one, be more like, I said, like an artist's collective, where in some sense there's a shared purpose, do your art, but everyone has their own art project. So overall, the structure itself isn't a tool in the same way? Or is that off? Yeah, I don't know if an artist collective is 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 a natural um is 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 a natural system. When I when I'm thinking about the difference between rational systems and national and and, and natural systems, I'm thinking about the difference between a tool or an organ and an organism. Right. So like uh, a hammer isn't in an organism, a heart isn't an organism. And most social ontologists compare institutions and social structures to, in a functionalist mode to either hammers or hearts. And when um, Scott proposes the possibility of a, that some institutions or organizations might be natural systems, I think what he, and following Selznick, I think what he's doing is 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 suggesting that some institutions might be usefully compared right to organisms, not to tools, not to not to their organs, um, and whether or not the art collective is uh, more usefully con conceived as a tool or an organism 
right? It's going to depend on, on, on what it is for something to be an organism. Um, so maybe we, let's, let's come back to the, like once, once I propose some criteria for whether, for what some, what might count, what may, might make a system count as an organism, let's come back to the art collective and see um, whether or not that satisfies the, the criteria. Um, so what, what is it that makes a system an organism as opposed to a tool, right? And, and one of the things that's so interesting about both of these possibilities is they're both teleologically oriented, okay? That an organism might, have, might be said to have a telos and a hammer might be said to have a telos, uh, but they're also really different. Organisms are obviously distinguishable from hammers. So what kind of telos typifies an organism? Um, and if we can answer that question, then maybe uh, we, can, we, we can be in a better position to figure out whether or not any organism, uh, organizations or institutions are more like organisms than they are like tools. So here, here's Selznick's uh, way of characterizing uh, an organism-like organization. Um, so a natural organization is deemed, so that's the underlined quote here, is deemed to have basic needs essentially related to self-maintenance. Okay, and then he goes on to, to, to kind of unpack that. Uh, a natural system develops repetitive means of self-defense and day-to-day -day activities interpreted in terms of the function served by that activity for the maintenance and defense of the system. Um, so that, that I think for, for these theorists gets at the difference between a natural system and a rational system. Natural systems are oriented towards their own persistence as such, whereas rational systems and, and tools and organs aren't oriented towards their own persistence as such, but oriented towards some other, other goal. And I think this is kind of easy to see in the case of the hammer. Like, Whatever the function of hammer of the hammer is, right, to dri drive nails, you can't include among its functions uh, that it uh, that it persists or that it that it right it somehow seeks to um, uh, survive uh, or to have anything like existential concern. Whereas an organism, you might say all organisms are characterized in, in terms of a of a survival goal, uh, and. And you know, among the various things that they do, many of those things uh, would seem to uh, facilitate uh, their their own persistence. Okay, and this this is even in Scott's definition of a natural organization when he characterizes natural organizations as collectivities that right. He characterizes natu uh, natural organizations as collectivities that recognize the value of perpetuating the organization. Right. So there's like a self persistence goal. This is going to be the thing. This is going to be that with the hallmark of, of an organism. So, Susan, back to your question about the artists, artist collective. If these theorists are right, like Selznick and Scott, the the artist collectivity would be a natural system that is something that's comparable to an organism. If, in some ways, we can identify a self persistence goal, right, um, as opposed to. Uh, a more tool-like goal, like, for example, facilitating and making possible uh, the creation of, of art. And that makes it more tool-like. Um, and I actually don't know if, if most art, artist collectives are fairly characterized in terms of, of a brute per self-persistence goal. Yeah. By the way, feel, feel free to just stop and, and if, if there's anything that I can do to clarify um, uh, what I'm getting at, uh, feel free to stop me. Uh, by the way, I, I disagree with Selznick uh, and I disagree with Scott. Uh, what I'm going to ultimately move away from the suggestion that, that organisms and life are characterized in terms of a self-persistence goal uh, and, and in that way distinguished from um, tools and organs. Um, I think that this is incorrect, but I also think that it's a really intuitive thought. Like it's not a crazy thing for have them to have posited, uh, but I just want to flag the fact that, that I'm going to uh, resist this thought eventually. Um, before I get to my critical, uh, my, my kind of critical moves when it comes to their characterization of natural institutions or natural organizations, I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are other social theorists besides Selznick and Scott who have also been thinking about institutions um, and, and, the, and the productive way in which it might be helpful to think about some institutions as being analogous to organisms. And I just, I just want to throw that out there. So like Nicholas Luhmann, is a uh, professor of sociology from Germany and um, 
and he's done a lot of work along these lines. I find this stuff just fascinating, very, very difficult. I need to spend more time working through it. Uh, but he says, he, he points out that the term autopoiesis, and we're going to come back to that in a little bit, has been invented to define life. And if life is defined in terms of autopoiesis, how could one refuse to describe social systems as autopoetic systems, right? So there it is. He's just like social systems, institutions, organizations are, are more like living systems than they are like tools. And then uh, another theorist, um, and he, this is a professor of management uh, who's at, at uh, Richard Pascal, who's at uh, Oxford University, um, also suggests that um, some corporations and some institutions qualify as complex adaptive systems, which uh, typify life. Uh, he gives four tests for what it is for something to be a complex adaptive system, and then uh, goes on to complain uh, to, to claim that treating organizations as complex adaptive systems provides use provides useful insight into the nature of strategic work or management thinking. Okay, one of the problems I have with Pascal's approach is that um, he has this normative edge, right? So he's been hired by Shell and all these other companies uh, to uh, kind of rethink their their approaches to uh, management and to strategic thinking and um, and he's so taken by this organism metaphor uh, that he uses this uh, to, to try to, I don't know, make more uh, efficient um, uh, corporation and, and management structures. And I think actually in his, his enthusiasm to derive, derive normative conclusions, I think he actually ends up misconstruing what it is for something to be agential. Um, but nevertheless, what he has to say is pretty interesting. Okay, so so the, the basic, so Scott's made this distinction between tool-like rational systems and organism-like natural systems, and has suggested that um, organizations might be characterized in terms of uh, in terms of one or the other of these categories. One might be more naturalistic, another institution might be more, more organismic. Um, and in support of this distinction between the rational and the natural, he appeals to another sociologist, a guy named Sheldon Messenger, who's also from Berkeley. So apparently Berkeley is a, a hub of this kind of work, uh, who wrote this really interesting, careful case study of uh, an organization in 19, that existed from the 1930s, early 1930s, to I think it, as late as uh, the 1970s, called the Townsend Organization. And he thinks that the Townsend organization exemplifies an organismic natural system for the following reasons. So the Townsend organization was originally created as a sort of political interest group. Um, it was created prior to the passing of US Social Security in 1936 by the Roosevelt administration. And it was created with the intention of advocating for some sort of um, uh, some sort some sort of pension plan for the elderly. Okay, but the problem is right. So that so did, right, the organization, the Townsend organization, is this political interest group, right? Had all sorts of members. Um, it was really active, and then all of a sudden, the Roosevelt administration did it, right? Created Social Security, which undermined the goal of the Townsend organization. Okay, now uh, upon the passing of, of, of Social Security in 1936. Uh, the Townsend organization existed for a few more years as a political action committee because Social Security didn't exactly follow the plan of the uh, of the Townsend, the proposed plan of the Townsend organization, right? So then what they did is they pivoted and they tried to, to, to talk about why Social Security should look more like the Townsend plan for pen, old age pensions. Uh, but that didn't really go anywhere. Uh, but rather than sort of magically sort of, I don't know, rather than just dissolve, the Townsend organization then pivoted again. Um, one of the things that they were doing over the course of this of, of this period is they were like selling like candy and like cookies, AKA like the Girl Scouts, uh, in order to raise money to advocate for the Townsend plan. Uh, and what they, they did is they just threw themselves into that, right? So all of a sudden they started making like gum, they started making cookies and it's it like the Townsend gum or the Townsend cookies. And they became, and then what was a political action committee just became a social club, right? So by the time, uh, like by, by, by like 1945, it, the Townsend organization, 
organization effectively moved from the political action committee right to a sales organization and recreation club and remained that until the 1970s when the last member of the Townsend organization died. So here's how Messenger describes what happened in the Townsend organization. Uh, the Townsend organization was ultimately oriented around the uh, purposive, right? What this shows is that rather than organization uh, oriented around uh, an explicit goal of say proposing old age pensions, old age pensions, what this shows is what these pivots show is that it's ultimately organ organized around the intrinsically purposive goal of quote maintaining the organizational structure as such, even at the loss of the organization's central mission. Okay, and uh, Messenger also says that some organizations, quote, may gain a certain degree of autonomy from their bases. And by bases, he means these purposes that, that would explain why they're created to continue to exist, unquote. Okay. So what is the Townsend organizations? What is that supposed to show us? It's supposed to show us that at least some institutions, right, don't exist for the purposes as stated in their mission statements, right? Uh, that institutions like living organisms have a sort of survival drive. And if their nominal mission, that is to create old age, age a system of old age pensions, uh, becomes irrelevant. Uh, these organism-like institutions will pivot to find some other purpose, uh, even if it has nothing to do with the original purposes for which they for which they were created. And it's this, right? These kind of pivots, which indicate that the institution is actually less tool-like and more organism-like. Okay. Um, I, ho I hope that makes sense, and I hope that that um, that the Townsend organization um, kind of helpfully articulates uh, what a, a natural system, an institution called natural system, might look like. Okay. All right. So my project over my sabbatical. All right, taken by this distinction between tool-like rational systems and organism-like natural systems. Uh, one thing that's really that really struck me. Oh, good. Yeah, this is a good time. Ron, yeah. Ron, your head, you have your hand raised. Unmute myself. myself. Okay. So so I I am wondering. You keep talking of it, it, these terms more or less like rational, more or less like a natural system. Yeah. Uh, I, I take I take it that you are not committed to the fact that the rational and the natural are mutually ex exclusive. Correct. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, not actually. Yeah, I I, I mean, it, yeah. It, right. I regard these as ideal types. All right. So there are some systems that are sort of closer to the ideal type of a tool. And there are some social systems that are closer to the ideal type uh, of, of, of an organism. And, and ultimately what I'm, I, I'm interested in is the way in so, which something can be both uh, at the same time. But so, before so, we can so, so, that possibility, right? We need to see the differences between uh, the, the, the two types of system. So, so, so are, are, are the two camps here uh on, on board with this i mean does the rational? i mean do you does kurt or somebody like searle who's on the rational side do they um do they simply say the other side is just wrong yeah the natural so most just, most just social wrong. ontologists would say that, yeah that 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 anyone who thinks that that institutions are are in any way actually non-metaphorically like organisms are simply wrong Right, they're they're sim simply confused. Uh, like Kirk Ludwig, Ludwig in his in his book at one point says, right, that it's just demonstrably false uh, that uh, institutions are anything like thinking things, uh, and so in no way uh, like an organism. Yeah. So, so how about the other side? Does does the natural side credit the rational as a as having its place too, but not yeah ex an yeah. So so place. those who think that it's possible that that institutions can be more like organisms or natural systems are like no one wants to deny that that institutions have a tool like view. So they tend to be more inclusive. Um, so okay. so look at this uh, just to, for evidence for that. Like look at this quote at the bottom uh, for Selznick, uh, right? And again, he he wants to admit the possibility that that 
that some institutions are more organism-like. And he says, quote, the most important thing about organizations is that, and here's that qualifier, though they are tools, each is never, each nevertheless has a life of its own. Okay, so er, everyone grants that um, that institutions can be uh, can be that our institutions are tool like. Some theorists also think that they're organism like. Um, and how for those those latter theorists, what is the relation? Can can an institution be, be both? I think it's an open and interesting question. Was it? Did that help, Ron? Okay. Um, so, so just bring, bring just just bringing this back to uh, so what what did I want to do with my sabbatical project? Um, when you look at these sociologists, I think they have some really interesting things to say about the organism like nature of institutions. Um, but I don't right. One thing that they didn't do is actually go and ask biologists what they think that organisms are, right? They're just working with an intuitive con conception uh, of, 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 of the living, uh, namely the living is characterized in terms of, of, of a survival, like self-persistence goal, um, as opposed to a tool. Uh, and then they just sort of run with it. And then uh, the messenger, for example, makes these interesting observations about, uh, about, about the, about the way in which the Townsend organization due to these pivots seems to be characterized by a survival goal over and above any sort of tool like mission statement. Um, so one of the things I spent a lot of time doing is reading um, theoretical biologists account of what they think uh, characterizes the organism or the living. And it turns out, right, uh, that a lot of these theorists, right, articulate something like that view that the living is characterized in terms of a self-persistence goal. Okay, so um, here's here's just a sample of, of some of these people. Um, Hans Jonas uh, is uh, has some really interesting, despite his work in in, in theology, has has some very interesting books uh, about the nature of of the organism, and uh, and he would concur that 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 the the, the organismal is characterized in terms of a self-persistence goal. So here's one quote. The fundamental point of departure is that life says yes to itself, right? And wishing itself to continue, it declares itself as a value. Uh, and there should be a, a closed quotation there. Uh, and again, the organism has to keep going because to be going is its very existence, which is uh, rec revocable. And threatened with extinction, extinction, it's concerned in existing. That second quote of Hans Jonas, notice how that exactly characterized behavior of the Townsend organization, right? It lost its reason for its existence. Social security was passed, right? But there's this almost organismal uh, drive to keep going. Uh, and so it pivots and becomes a recreational, organ uh, a recreational club and sales um, organization. Uh, Francisco Varela, uh, he coined the term autopoiesis and characterizes autopoetic closure uh, which characterizes all living things as quote the self as self production, um, and self production is already and inevitably a self affirmation that shows the organism is involved in the fundamental purpose of maintaining its identity. Okay, and so on and so forth. So DePaulo uh, has the same thing, uh, and Marino and Masso in their 2015 book uh, says self maintenance grounds normativity. Its conditions for existence are the intrinsic and naturalized norm. Of its, of, of its acti activity, right? So if you wanna understand what an organism is, it's characterized by something like a self-persistence drive, according to all these theorists, okay? And that's exactly what Selznick thinks. That's exactly what Scott thinks. And to the extent that organisms, uh, sorry, organizations or institutions are characterized by a self-persistence goal, uh, then they're more organismic-like um, in addition to being tool-like. Uh, I, I was talking to my friend, um, Asa Berman, uh, about some of this stuff, and she brought, the, brought up this really interesting uh, fact, where, right, which I think it works in this, in this space. Uh, she's, in, uh, she's from, Swe uh, from Sweden, and she says that, uh, you know, when, uh, when academics, the Swedish government uh, requires of academics who uh, ask for grants, that they specify not only what they're supposed to do or what they would do with the grant money, 
but the conditions under which they would stop doing it. Okay. Um, so I don't know, you want to, you, you know, you want, you want to, you want to build an institution and the, the Swedish government requires them to specify when uh, it either succeeds or fails. Uh, and on either condition, whether or not the institution that's being built succeeds or what, if it fails, right, uh, then the, the person who receives the grant is obliged to shut it down. And I think the reason why the Swedish government does this is to pre prevent something like what happened with the Townsend organization, where the institution bit, right, just becomes sort of more preoccupied, not with bringing about a certain function or bringing about a certain useful goal, uh, but becomes more preoccupied with its self-existence. I thought that was like a really interesting requirement that the, the Swedish government puts uh, on uh, those who, who, who ask for money. Okay, so against all of this, I wanna, I wanna say that organisms, despite right what these theoretical biologists are saying, despite, despite what these sociologists are saying, I want to say that it's a mistake to characterize organisms in, in terms of a self-persistence goal. Um, and to motivate that, um, let me just say, uh, just draw attention to a couple of concerns uh, of, about this characterization of the organism. Okay, um, One is uh, a concern about cognitive capacities, right? So you might worry that a lizard or a bacterium uh, doesn't have the the cognitive capacity to work to to be able to worry or be concerned about its own uh, self persistence. And I think this is a theme um, that is, runs through the animal welfare literature. Here's Aaron Simmons. When we witness animals' self protective behavior in the face of threats to their lives, is it really their continued existence that they are desiring and thinking about protecting? Or is it perhaps only the threat of pain that concerns them? Right? We right. With our relatively sophisticated cognitive capacities, right, and maybe elephants, I don't know what else, many, or at least some animals can be concerned, right, uh, with their self-persistence, but a lizard, and even if a lizard could, a bacterium, right, are they really cognitively equipped uh, to be concerned with self-persistence, right, or are, are their concerns much more simple than that, okay, right, pain avoidance. Um, here's another concern. Um, if this self-persistence goal characterized all life, then it seems like it would be very difficult to find concerns and behaviors that weren't particularly oriented around self-persistence. Uh, but it might be that many organisms do things that seem irrelevant to their survival. Uh, indeed, um, Many organisms, especially human beings, often do things that seem explicitly antithetical to their survival. Here, I'm thinking about Martin Luther King, right, putting himself up uh, in front of crowds of people. Uh, so if this is this kind of primeval uh, orientation, why are organisms doing things that don't seem particularly um, conducive to fitness? So this is a problem, uh, I think. And it, it leads me to, 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 to want to rethink what it is that characterizes the organism versus a tool. Uh, um, before I get to that positive proposal, let me just say that um, I think there's many philosophers at least who can acknowledge these two concerns, uh, but then they retreat into an entirely different um, conception of the organism that I'd like to avoid. I'll call this a, a different conception, um, strong teleoskepticism. Okay, so you might say, oh, of course, bacteria aren't concerned with, or aren't capable of being concerned with their own survival. Uh, they don't, they're not cognitively equipped to that, right? But they're just soft, squishy machines. They can't be concerned with anything, right? So here's John Searle, he's a philosopher. And he says, we take it for granted in biology that life and survival are all values, right? Which sounds like the kind of thing that, that um, the inactivists were saying. But then he, 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 uh, he recharacterizes that claim. He says, however, it's intrinsic to us, right? Not to the organism, to us, that we hold these values. Uh, and that the attribution of these survival values to nature uh, uh, that is independent of us is observer relative. So essentially what John Searle is saying is that uh, organisms, 
don't have any goals. They don't have any concerns whatsoever. They don't have survival concerns. They don't have any concerns. They're just these machines, these blind machines. And that any attribution of concern to them is something that we're, we human beings are projecting onto nature, right? But in fact, they're just squishy, soft, squishy, soft machines, okay? Um, I don't wanna go in that direction either. Right. So, so I'm trying to, to thread the needle. Right. I don't want to say a bacteria that they're concerned with their own survival. I don't think that they, they're cognitively equipped to do that. But I also don't want to take the John, John Searle, Searle. Or, and Cartesian route and say, well, they don't have any concerns whatsoever. Right. Uh, they're just uh, blind machine uh, or uh, organic machines. Uh, I want to I want to talk about something that that uh, I, I want to try to conceive of of, uh, of of kind of normativity or kind of outlook that is. Um, that, that falls into neither of these, these extremes. One problem I have with teleoskepticism is if we start conceiving of bacteria or lizards as just very, um, as blind, soft machines, um, then all of a sudden what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an, an ontological gap between us and the rest of nature, okay? That we have subjectivity, that we have concerns, we have normativity, uh, normative, a normative outlook, and if we deny that lizards have anything like this, then all of a sudden, right, we're back in bed with Descartes, right? There's, we're gonna, we have a dual as an unbridgeable divide between us and the rest of nature, right? So, so how can we talk about the concerns that a lizard might have, or even a bacteria might have that doesn't fall into teleoskepticism and yet doesn't inflate the concerns such that a bacteria can be concerned with its own existence? How can, how can, how can we, Come up with it with with uh, a, a sort of middle way, a middle way of thinking about um, natural agent uh, agency. Okay, and to that end, um, this is my positive account, right? So this is a way, kind of the heart of the presentation. I can see I maybe only have ten more minutes, so I'll try to to sum it up after presenting this positive account. Okay, so the goal is to avoid. Um, Avoid what these the theoretical biologists are doing. Avoid attributions of of self of, of, of self. Uh, avoid attributing a self persistence goal to um, single celled organisms, and at the same time, uh, avoid scientific naturalism, which would just uh, reduce everything uh, to to machines. Um, so here's a kind of opening example to to think about this this third. P proposal. I, I'll call my proposal the precedential account of natural agency. Um, so my, just thinking about my own kids, um, they're organisms, right? So maybe something that they do uh, can, can tell us something about, about the nature of life as a whole. Uh, when they're very young, and, and I think many parents have had this experience, um, I put a fan in their room, right? Because it's Florida and it's hot. And to, to try to keep their room cooler. Uh, but then what happened is it got cooler, right? Uh, winter time. And I removed the fan because it was no longer necessary to keep the room down. And Quinn asked me to put the fan back, not because he needed the room to be cooler, but because he started to, to require as a condition for falling asleep, the fan noise. Okay, so all of a sudden, right, what I want us to get from this example is that this arbitrary thing, like I didn't put the fan in there because it made noise. I put the fan in his room to cool it down. I no longer needed to cool it down, but this arbitrary thing, the fan noise, became for Quinn normatively inflected, right? And it became a requirement. It became something that he wanted. Um, and I think there might be something a little bit revelatory about this, uh, that this is um, this 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 sensitivity, this this the the way in which we take our past, the way in which our past becomes normatively inflected, even when features of that past are utterly arbitrary, um, might give us some insight into the nature of natural agency. Okay, so here's my proposed precedential account of natural agency, and I reduced it to three claims. Okay, so the first is just a claim about the nature of, of organismic behavior, that they engage in what might be called exploratory behavior. Um, and by that, I mean, right, the organisms just do random things. Okay, uh, they live, as Stuart Kaufman, a theoretical biologist, say, 
a, a theoretical bi biologist describes as um, organisms exist near the edge of chaos. Okay, organisms aren't machines. They're constantly doing things that surprise us and maybe even surprise themselves. Okay, um, there's a, there's a, right, they, they live, as, as Kaufman puts it, they live on the threshold between the ordered and the disordered, right, right on that edge. Okay, so that's the, the first claim. The second claim, and this is the heart of these three claims, is that precedent, that is what an organism does, becomes the basis for intrinsic normativity. So say an organism, because it exists on, on, on uh, the edge, at the edge of chaos, does something randomly, okay? Uh, upon this stimulus, this organism, right, turns right, right, or whatever. It just does it randomly, right, because they exist on the, on the edge of chaos, okay? Other organisms don't. Even though that started, that, that was like this random thing that started, okay, the organism will take that as precedent and endow it with normativity over time, right? So the next time the organism encounters the stimulus, even though the first time it did it, it turned right randomly, the next time, right, it comes, that, that stimulus, right, that right kind of, um, uh, the, the, the stimulus that, that, that implored it to move right begins to, to carry normative rate, weight so that in the future it turns right. Um, that I don't know how to, how to put this because I don't know what it feels like to be in a single-celled organism, right? But, but it carries normative weight. Um, it feels, feels impelled, right? It, it just, right, this becomes, starts to feel like the right thing to do, okay? Now, this is backward-looking normativity. Right, so it does what it does because that's what it did before, um, and this is going to be very different than the forward-looking normativity that Selznick and the, these theoretical biologists like uh, Hans Jonas and Varela are looking at. Right, they they're seeing they're seeing organisms as trying to survive, right, forward-looking, and what I'm trying to do is say, yeah, they feel something like normative weight. But the normative weight has nothing to do with a, a trying to accomplish something, namely survival, and has everything to do with this kind of past orientation, like, ah, in this situation, because I did this before, I should do this again. Okay, even though the first time it did it, it did it randomly, right, because organisms exist at the edge of chaos. That's going to be condition one. Okay, so now you have all these organisms that feel something like normative weight, right? They're doing uh, what they did before because precedent demands it uh, of them. Well, often this thing that they're doing randomly isn't good, right? Like it will move them to die, okay? And so this is where natural selection enters the picture. Uh, many of these intrinsic backward looking norms uh, conduce to death, uh, but because those organisms die, all right, the only norms that are left are the ones that just happen to be conducive to life. Right, but the, the important thing to see here is that that these organisms aren't doing what they're doing because it's conducive to life, right? They don't have the cognitive capacities to even appreciate that. They're doing what it's they're doing if there's a normative edge to this because that's what they did before. But because right uh, organisms that do what they do because that's what they did before, if if what they do is 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 detrimental, right? They die, leaving only the organisms that do what they did because that's what they did before. Uh, leaving only those doings that also happen to be conducive to life. But from the organism's perspective, perspective that's not why they're doing it, right? So it's utterly backward looking, but natural selection also explains why most organisms tend to behave in ways that are conducive to life. They do it, but that's not why they're doing it. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense, okay. Uh, okay, so... Um, The upshot of this is that organisms take precedent seriously. Okay, now I'm gonna skip this. I think there's some really interesting connections to be made between Kathleen's Wallace, Kathleen Wallace's cumulative network model of personal identity. Uh, now she's talking about human identity, but she's actually thinking about human identity in these terms, but also Max Weber's account of traditional society, right? So the legitimacy of traditional rule, according to Max Weber is based on and believed in by virtue of the sanctity of long established orders and rulings and ruling powers that existed have existed time in, uh, out of mind. What, what I'm getting from Weber here is that there are these traditional societies and when you ask them why do they do what they do, they're just like, that's because we did it before, 
right? What they don't say is because that's going to be conducive to society's survival or anything like that, right? That's that's an innovation that comes along later, right? So I want to see it, a sort of isomorphism between um, traditionalism and the stance of the organism. Okay, almost done. Okay, so what does the Townsend look, organization look like through this lens, okay? And I wanna say actually the Townsend organism, its organization doesn't look very organismic, okay? Indeed, what's striking about the Townsend organization is that when it pivoted away from concerns about pensions and towards uh, consumer concerns about, I don't know, selling cookies or something like that, what's striking actually is the Townsend's organization uh, Townsend organization's utter disregard for its own history. Okay, that is the Townsend organization died at that moment, right? It's utterly, right? It's utterly unresponsive to its own history. And so actually doesn't look like an organism uh, on the proposed account, um, right? If there's too great a gap between a, an institution at time one and an institution at time two, um, that's, that's an indication that the institution has a tool-like quality and not an organism-like quality, right? So organisms are necessarily historically oriented. It's, it's precisely the gaps that would reveal it to be something other than uh, a natural system, okay? Now contrast this with um, the judicial system. So, uh, and thanks to Stephen Paul, small page for um, pointing uh, me to, um, to this thinker, Hugh he Heckler, Hecklow, who's a, a political scientist, he articulates what he calls a novel appreciative system called institutional thinking, okay? Um, so what is it when someone has institutional thinking? And first of all, it's always within the context of, of, of an institution. And I think it's typified by judicial behavior. So as a basic orientation towards life, Heckler says institutional thinking understands itself to be in a position primarily of receiving rather than inventing and creating. Okay, uh, so the emphasis is not on critical thinking, but on thoughtfully taking delivery of and using what's been handed down to you, right? So the institutional thinker, like the judge, right, is someone that takes history super seriously uh, in the same way that, that I'm proposing an organism does, right? When it takes the fact that it did something in the, in the past as a reason for, do, for acting in the way that it does now. Okay, and, and then he goes on to say, this doesn't mean closing off to any form of innovation, right? Like they, they don't get lost in the past. Institutional thinkers aren't, aren't antiquarian, right? But it starts with the past. Um, and then innovation might take place with, with, within an understanding um, that the, the past is, is sacred, okay? And then, re and then Heckler re-characterizes institutional thinking as precedent as a form of solidarity, which I think is really beautiful, right? Okay. So kind of bringing this home, this last slide. Um, Ronald Dworkin's conception of law, um, first of all, places a lot of stress on institutional thinking in Heckler's sense, uh, places a lot of weight on the importance of precedent, uh, at least as far as, as justices are concerned. And he characterizes law as integrity. But what he's getting at with integrity is that the justice is in a position of taking the past and then reapplying it to novel, the, the lessons of the past to novel situation in a way that creates a point of con continuity between the past and the present. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is, this is Dworkin's Law's integrity. But you might say, oh, okay, fine. Yeah, justices do do this. They have institutional thinking. But that doesn't mean that the law, uh, right? It's one thing to grant that. It's quite another to say that the grant that, that the law takes the form of an organism rather than a tool. Uh, but what's so interesting about Dworkin and some underappreciated passages uh, is that this is exactly the, the 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 conclusion that Dworkin himself draws. Okay, now. He, uh, so here's the, here's the quotation. My account of political integrity takes personification seriously, as if a political community really were some special kind of distinct entity, and of course I read organism there, distinct from the actual people who are citizens. Okay, worse, my account of law and of integrity attributes moral agency and responsibility to that distinct agency. Okay, and then going down to the next quote, this personification runs deep. It consists 
in taking the corporation seriously as a moral agent. Okay. Uh, right. So, so Dworkin actually makes the conclusion, right? Draws the conclusion that I think is, is right. Is that from, if you want to identify natural systems, look towards systems that take their own, their own history seriously. Okay. Um, that make sense of their present actions as, as continuous with and in line with the actions of their past, right? This is what distinguishes a, a, a natural institution from a rational institution, uh, which only looks to say the goals of a mission statement to define their own action. And such institutions come to take on an organismic quality. If that, indeed, if I, if I have any problem with, with Dworkin's uh, characterization, I think personification is not the right word, right? If institutions are like organisms, right? They're, they're like, these institutions are like organisms. They're like organisms, right? That are more akin to like single celled organisms and less like us, like we're organisms, right? Uh, but, um, but I think he's looking at the wrong type of organism, namely us as a model. Nevertheless, I like the fact that he's now thinking about the law in terms of agency. And the reason why he thinks about the law in terms of as having an agency is precisely because of this backward looking orientation. Okay, that's it. I have a bunch of questions, but um, we don't, but I, I'd rather, I'd rather hear from, from, from you. So thank you uh, for this. Hey, Melinda. Hey, I'm like very selfishly putting my hand right back up, but you know, Rachel had her hand up before I did, and maybe she would like to ask her question. Oh, I, yeah, let me, you know what, let me Linda pull the chat Linda had her up. hand up before realize. I did, actually. I, I, I should have had you go up. first and I'll, I'll um, ask mine afterwards. <laughs> okay, um, thanks, Rachel. Um, just very quickly, I think this is really engaging for environmental ethics, which I uh, should have realized before. And um, it's funny that we've spoken about this project like in a variety of ways and I hadn't really like understood this connection before today. So it's just like a really cool opportunity. Um, so in environmental ethics, we spend a lot of time like in the first couple of units trying to establish like why um, natural entities should have values. And you know, environmental ethicists take things like rock formations to be limit cases. Um, and so they're like comparing things like trees with um, uh, with bears and then, you know, rock formations and mountains and things like that. Um, and then they want to, they're interested in excluding things like highways, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to say things like, well, you know, we, we should preserve X, Y, or Z, but we shouldn't try to preserve necessarily, I mean, not from an environmental ethics standpoint anyway, um, something like a highway. Uh, so how do we like create like a claim about the intrinsic value of these entities. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so anyway, so I think it's really interesting to compare Joel Feinberg and um, Atfield's conversation. Robin Atfield reacts to Joel Feinberg and they focus on like a needs and interests picture that I think is like has resonance with some of what you're saying. And so I was just gonna offer like a question related to that. So essentially they want to talk about something that they call um, a latent tendency as compared mm. to a natural fulfillment. Yeah. So uh, latent tendencies and natural fulfillments together along with some other things are supposed to like establish like that something has needs and interests essentially. Um, but a latent tendency is like kind of a weird thing at the edge of the living and the non-living. Yeah, so yeah, I wanted yeah. to ask you about it. So basically latent tendency, a highway has a latent tendency to fall apart, mm -hmm. to break up. Um, and an, yeah. an IV strives or something like that, or strives against like a wall or, you know, whatever. Um, so these latent tendencies can be shared like across these two different types, like the mechanistic and the, or the dead and the living, let's just say. For oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Movies. Um, so could you say something about, do you think that latent tendency is taken up like in your account here in, in yeah. the way that you're describing the precedential? Or yeah. do you think that it's like not the same at all? And, and I guess like, I'm just sort of recommending that environmental ethics is like super fruitful place to like have this conversation. Maybe we can continue the conversation, but that's just my question is, 
is a latent tendency, <laughs> the kind of thing that's taken up in your precedential account? Um, yeah. Or is it natural fulfillment or do neither really work or something? Yeah, like this that? Well, it's just super interesting. And thank you. Um, and and I'll, I'll press you uh, for these, these references later because I, I already I can see that this is just so relevant. Um, and maybe I can I can piggyback on some of this good work that's that's being that's being done. Um, and uh, so so when I initially thought about the, the the distinction between latent tendencies and natural fulfillments, I, I thought, oh, okay, latent tendencies are more mechanical, natural fulfillments are more organismic. Uh, but but actually, it looks it sounds more complicated than that, right? That that organisms can have both and and mechanical things. Tools can have latent tendencies, like highways can have latent tendencies. Uh, so so the um, the distinction isn't going to quite uh, between the two isn't going to quite track the distinction between tools and and organisms. Um, but but um, what I'm trying to do is articulate uh, a phenomenology of the organism, right, of the non-human. Um, Right. That, that is, I'm convinced that there is a what it's like to be a bat, right? Even if we have a hard time uh, talking about it and that there's going to be many latent tendencies within the organism that's going to fall outside of its own phenomenology, uh, right? So that whatever it's like to be a bat, um, it's also, a bat's also going to have a latent tendency, for example, to pump blood through its circulatory system. Right, so that so latent tendencies can be characteristic, as I'm understanding the distinction, can be characteristic of, of organisms. But actually, those latent tendencies aren't what I'm particularly interested in because they fall out outside the scope of what it's like to be a bat. Um, and what I am interested in is maybe what what you've been calling natural fulfillments. Uh, that is right. Uh, natural fulfillments are the, are the felt lived world um, of, of of the bat. Um, uh, as ex as experienced by the bat, um, right? So that that it finds itself driven, uh, you know, to to I don't know, it's, you know, I, I have no idea, like, but to echolocate or whatever. Um, and natural fulfillments, unlike um, latent tendencies, right? The temptation by many of the theoretical biologists to say, okay, fine, natural fulfillments. Uh, well, those are always characterized in terms of of, of a self preservation goal. Or something like that, right? That's and what that's it is to be. That's where you're nuancing, and you're saying actually, yeah. it's maybe even the opposite of that, because right. that's a yeah. post hoc rationalization. It's post hoc rationalization, yeah, okay. yeah, that's exactly it, right? So, so, a, so a natural fulfillment would then be something like, right, the way in which a bat takes up its own history, right, uh, right? It's it's lived, right, and uh, and it it does things like it's normatively oriented, but it does things because that's what it did. Uh, in the past. And this is where things sort of get, uh, you know, a little, I, I grant, get a little bit un, unclear, uh, but I think it's the right kind of space to think about it. Now, what's the relationship between structural fulfillments as we're construing it here and latent tendencies? Uh, I think over the course of evolutionary time, natural fulfillments, which, right, which track the phenomenology of the bat, can um, become latent tendencies, right? So, in, in, right, something that was sort of phenomenologically present to an organism can get suppressed and just become mechanical um, over, over time as, you know, problems get solved and, and uh, as, as new, new problems ar arise uh, for, for the organism, right? So I think that there is uh, a movement from uh, the, the natural fulfillment to the latent tendency via uh, uh, what, what's sometimes called um, canal, canalization. Um, you know, and then and occasionally maybe even latent tendencies, right, can become unlatent and can kind of re-express themselves um, in, in the phenomenology of an, of an, of an, of an organism. Uh, but it's still the case, right, just as I can be concerned about uh, lunch but not be concerned about, you know, how to circulate blood in my own body, um, we, we do want to drive a, draw a line between um, the phenomenology of an, the kind of normativity normatively latent phenomenology of an organism and all the stuff that's that that's that's sort of outside the scope of that what it's like to be a bat. Thank, thanks, Melinda. That, that was really interesting. Um, and, and, and I hope that we're, we have a chance to talk about that again. Rachel. So at this point, mine is more of a thanks, comment thanks. than a question. 
um, because you you sort of got to the answer to my question already, and I put my hand down. Um, but a couple of comments first. Um, I really like your characteris or your characterization of the social ontologist as sociology through a philosopher's lens, um, yep. <laughs> because I had always, I mean, there's so much overlap um, with what you do and the types of things that, that sociologists think about. Um, but what I found most striking in your talk was your discussion of the Townsend organization. And yeah. as you started talking about it, I was thinking about um, the way that I introduce social movement organizations, even to students in sociology 101. And a point that I make about social, organ social movement organizations is that ideally they are effective enough that they stamp out the need for their own existence, essentially. Right. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's what your friend from Sweden was saying about when, um, when some organization applies for money from the government, um, they're asked about what conditions um, need to take place in order for them to, you know, stop needing the money. And so I was thinking, wow, the, the Townsend organization is sort of like the opposite of right. an efficient yeah. social yep. movement um, because, you know, it succeeded and then it continued to justify its existence even though its mission had already been fulfilled. Yeah, that that is, uh, Rachel, that's 100% exactly what I, yeah, although you managed to say it in far fewer words than I managed to. Uh, yes, that's exactly, that was exactly the point that the Townsend organization, right, <laughs> is like a tool gone wrong. Uh, it, it's a metastasized tool. Uh, metastasizing tool, maybe. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. A metastasized tool? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like administering a corpse. We're all the way back to our reading group question. You're right. You administer a corpse. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Josh, I also had just a quick comment about, so you keep taking us to the single cell organism. Um, perhaps yeah. given these times, we, you could even work below the single cell organism. So not the bacterium, but the virus, um, because viruses certainly evolve in order to survive, even though I don't think that they have cognitive tendencies or yeah, yeah. abilities at all. So. Yeah, you're, and, and, and you're, you're so right about this. I, you know, like I'm just using the single cell organism as sort of a representative representative of an organism that's not like us. Um, but, uh, but, but I'd, I'd hardly want to take a stand on um, where life begins or ends. And, and all of this might, might well apply to, to the viral. I think, I think, I think that's, that, that's exactly right. Thanks, Rachel. Anybody else? We are all that's left. <laughs> oh, <laughs> everyone had to go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, good. I, if I mean, if there if there's any other questions, we have we have a couple more minutes. Uh, but otherwise, I, I'd love to take up this 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 conversation um, afterwards and in, in different locations. Yeah, I mean, I think that it would be really interesting to pick that, this back up, like in light of especially the attempt in environmental ethics to establish intrinsic value for particular yeah. things, because they really do have to try to include things that aren't normally seen as sentient, you know, and, yeah. and people talk in all kinds of ways about trees. Um, yeah. It's really interesting. And students will often say, well, trees aren't sentient, like right off the bat. Yeah. And I'm like, really? You want to just double yeah. check on that one for me? <laughs> you know, I'm like, what does that, what does that mean? But so there's these like arenas of fights that have been had yeah. for 50, 60 years in, in some of these literatures about stuff like trees and rock formations that I think, yeah, anyway. That, that, just, that, that might be relevant. You know, along those, yeah. those lines, um, so, you know, Harry, Harry's had to go. Um, but, but I ended up talking with Harry um, a, about some of this stuff um, a couple of weeks ago, and he got, he got really animated about it. And part of where his animation was coming from was that, um, that, that maybe we can make sense of, um, you know, the Gaia, the, the, the much derided Gaia hypothesis, 
in mm. these in these terms, right? And so the Gaia hypothesis seems really unpl- implausible if we work with like an over overly cognitivist account of yeah. what it is to 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 be an organism or what it is to be an agent, right? And that's all that's the problem I was trying to draw. Uh, attention to, you know, to Hans Jonas's like focus on, 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 on life goals and this kind of thing. However, um, if it's possible, right, that what it is to be an agent is to, right, just systematically incorporate and um, continuously um, integrate one's own life history, right? So, so in some sense, one, right, one, one's just kind of in a process of self, self-creation. Uh, and if, Right. Just as as I've been trying to say, well, maybe the U.S. Supreme Court is sufficient, right? Satisfy these these conditions in in, in at least a sufficient way to qualify as as uh, as an agent, as a non cognitive agent. Um, maybe it's also the case that Gaia as a whole um, satisfies it. And indeed, um, it seems far more plausible to me uh, that Gaia as a whole would satisfy this condition of the organism than it, than it would uh, that a human uh, institution would. Um, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so just just by bracketing sort of down our expectations, I mean, I, 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 sort, I sort of see like the problem, you know, with the distinction between natural and, and rational systems is, right, in, inevitably we take ourselves as a model of, 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 of the organism of the organismal and then the agency and we see our own preoccupation aka Ayn Rand with self-preservation uh, and immediately projecting that onto the world um, but, uh, but but maybe there's a more open conception of, of, of the organismic that that is sufficient for us to take something like sorry this is gonna get cheesy for for, for, yeah. for a moment but allows us to take something like an attitude of natural piety towards the world yeah yeah right yeah. where all of a sudden like if you owe if, it if agency is yeah. more um it, it is less rare uh than than our conceptions of it would would suggest uh then um we're not justified in simply treating the world uh as as the standing reserve as this this set of resources to be exploited yeah. Exactly. Um, and this is why the environmental ethics angle runs so deep in this project that I'm from my vantage point, because I think that that's like precisely the kind of attitude that folks are looking for. And like Lori Gruen and eco feminists in general try to claim that we should have like a loving eye rather than a, an arrogant eye. And I think that the loving eye is really connected to what you're describing. Basically, like they talk about climbing mountains and um, you know, the way in which like you climb a mountain, like being a point of divergence, like from arrogance, yep. you know, that you could go toward arrogance or you could go toward love and, and all of these things. And I think students do tend, you you talked about it being like corny or something like that. I think they do kind of tend to think, oh, well, this is a bit corny, but it makes like a huge dip. So when we start talking about lumber, you know, or, or deforestation, they sort of get it a bit more like, okay, like, are we, yeah. and that goes back to the standing reserve point, you know, in what way do we take up our attitude toward the world around? Yeah. And, 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 and the analogy is so like going back to Heckle, you know, and his idea of, of institutional thinking, right. Where, and I just love the way that he characterizes this is just this like solidarity with the past, uh, yeah, you know, and sol- and solidarity with others. And, and I'm just like, actually, I think like what Heckle is getting at with respect to the political, yeah. you know, it is. It could apply. Yeah. It could apply. Yeah. You know, that yeah. we, we, we see ourselves like in, we see ourselves in in the eyes of another organism um, as 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 fundamentally continuous with, but also different from uh, that right um, that that organism. Maybe all the way up to the cosmological scale. I don't know, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, this, the, yeah. You 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 seem like right into the heart of my concerns. <laughs> with, you know, my, my preoccupation with, <laughs> with, well, with this material. Talk. Thank you so uh, thanks. much. Thanks, now that we're for... literally, we have offices next door to each other, but we've got Chris here. <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> here, here we're cross-fight. talking about like I'm a... not complaining. I'm not complaining. <laughs> like we have, we're talking about an unmediated relationship with the world, uh, and yet here and we here are. We over are. Zoom. <laughs>
exactly. Thank anyway, you, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, thank and you Miranda, thanks for sticking sticking through with the to the end. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. All right. Bye. Uh, the video right. should be up tomorrow. Okay, Dr. Rust. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a great Bye. day. Bye.